we're hoping to hear again from the folks who've got plans for deployment uh, for this session. And we're looking forward to, uh, to the excitement and the things that you bring by trying to make some of this stuff real. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to our first speaker, Carl Perez of Elysium Industries. Thank you, David, and, and obviously uh, what a pleasure to, to be presenting at the MSR workshop. Uh, this is actually my first time, uh, although we, uh, we founded Elysium Industries in, in 2015. And so, uh, as you can tell, we're going to take a slightly different direction from what we've traditionally done. Uh, we've really focused on presenting technology, and uh, I'll be discussing a bit of what I think as a, as a community we, uh, we should be doing on top of some updates, obviously. So just to give you a, a little bit of uh, Elysium's ethos, uh, when we started the company, it was basically a bunch of anti-nuclear entrepreneurs like myself and uh, naval reactor designers that had worked on advanced concepts uh, for decades uh, within the US Naval Reactor Program. And the first thing we wanted to do was obviously address the elephants in the room. Uh, I have to make a comment. This is my, one of my favorite exhibits by Greg Colbert, Canadian, uh, called Ashes and Snow. So I had to make that reference. With that said, we're really focused on engineering social impact. And so we were, as I said, anti-nuclear entrepreneurs mixed with naval reactor advanced concept designers. And essentially, we were technology agnostic uh, to start with. So we didn't really care about what nuclear reactor technology we were going to pursue as long as it achieved what we were trying to uh, convey. And that was a real overhaul of nuclear technology as we know it. As I said, I was formerly anti-nuclear to the point where my father was protesting against the construction of nuclear power plants in France, and here I am. And uh, there's a reason for that, because I actually worked in uh, renewables in Southeast Asia. And uh, when you realize the limitations of the technologies, uh, you realize that 24-7 carbon-free power cannot go uh, ignored. And so instead of going for a technology that we were passionate about, that we were experts in, and then trying to add on passive safety non-proliferation, um, the capability of burning nuclear waste. Basically what we did is we set those parameters and then we chose a design. And we thought that was a much more cost-effective way of obviously uh, commercializing a, a reactor, uh, but also ensuring that the economics uh, took into consideration the many issues that the industry has. And those industries, you know, those issues are, are perception driven in many regards and, and technology driven and, and others. And, I was the first one to realize that uh, nuclear waste was actually not a technical problem. It was, it was more of a political problem, but it stays a problem. And uh, obviously economic competitiveness is really a hybrid because a lot of the perceptions around nuclear are what have been limiting uh, the amount of investment uh, in it among other elements. And I'll speak to that a bit afterwards. What you have right here are the two different uh, reactors I think that are of, of relevance to the discussion here. Uh, obviously, to the right, you have our 3,000 megawatt thermal, which equates to 1,200 megawatts electric reference design uh, with the capability of obviously uh, feeding many different high temperature end uses, and I'll get back to that a little later. Uh, and on the left, you see uh, basically our uh, molten salt reactor experiment uh, that we plan to have operational in 2028. If we can beat that date, we will. What you'll notice is that the 10 megawatt thermal demo uh, obviously has an objective that is different than the uh, power producing demo. And so our objective really is to make sure that scalability uh, is a thing in the nuclear business. And uh, what I mean by that is the fact that when we started Elysium, we told ourselves if we want to be able to increase the output, and my honors thesis was actually on, uh, on the sub-Saharan African energy sector, and we're telling ourselves there are many nations such as Ghana that can, can't necessarily take uh, more than 200 megawatts electric on the grid. And so we need to be able to find a way to scale up without having to purchase new reactors. And so what we have figured out is a way to be able to add modules. They're all the same size. The pumps, the heat exchangers, they're all the same. Um, and basically we connected the core vessel to the different nozzles that you can see um, to the left. But as you can see over these pictures, uh, obviously, it does not scale exactly to 500, 1,000, 1,500, uh, but it's just to give you a sense of the possibilities that we can achieve um, with this technology. And for us, the way we see it is these are development packages that we will sell in emerging economies, particularly where one module can do uh, electricity, another can desalinate, another one can produce hydrogen. And so we're in the middle of working with our partners to find ways to be able to optimize uh, those uh, 
those multiple uh, end uses. Uh, obviously, with renewables coming online and their variability, we want to make sure that we can adapt uh, to that variability and use a turbine bypass if we need uh, to be able to shift over different utilizations. But that obviously poses certain economic issues because if you're not constantly desalinating, then how are you going to make up for the cost of that plant? So again, this is really an effort that we've been undergoing with many of our different partners. And as you can see at the bottom, every single module, including the core, is road shippable. As I said, these are a wide variety of end uses that we can achieve. We're at high temperature. Uh, but one of obviously the things that we've been championing for a while is the use of spent nuclear fuel waste, as well as plutonium, as well as depleted uranium, and other major actinides that we want to get rid of or use. And uh, in fact, we've really been stealthy in many regards over the past couple of years. Uh, we didn't want to come out with this waste burning capability up until we had the capability, uh, or at least a, a notion of how we would build up that capability. And in 2017, we were able to demonstrate that with Idaho National Lab and Argonne National Lab. Uh, and so we were able to demonstrate that we can convert nuclear waste into elysium reactor fuel in a method that NSA determined as not reprocessing. And this was a major breakthrough for us because this is something that we want to be able to do around the world. Now, these are all very good and ambitious dreams, but this is the path to get there. As I said, in 2028, we want to have this demonstration plan constructed. If we can beat that target, we will. Uh, the objective, the, really the grand objective, is by 2040, 2050, and in that time frame, to completely decarbonize the world. Is the reason why I created Elysium, is the reason why many of my colleagues joined in this effort. But as you can see, uh, I'm wearing an eye patch, uh, and it's not because uh, I'm trying to look like a pirate. Uh, fortunately, uh, I was actually, uh, I got a successful surgery for, uh, for two tumors in my eye. And uh, for a little bit, we thought it'd go to the brain. Um, that definitely made me think about a lot of things very differently. And the one thought that kept crossing my mind is, how can we quickly deploy this technology? What do we need to do? And as you can see on this chart right here, the International Energy Agency has not placed too much faith <laughs> in nuclear. And uh, basically, this is just a, a graph that shows a stated policy scenario. And what does this show? It shows that the policies today want two terawatts of natural gas to be able to decarbonize the world. Now, as we've seen today, there are many technologies in development in the national labs and the universities, but amongst vendors, um, there are about 20 MSR efforts worldwide and let's just assume that we each sell 100 reactors and that we're producing one gigawatt reactors. Many of the concepts on, on, um, in this panel are, are also SMRs. Uh, so that's, you know, let's assume 300 reactors instead of 100. But this is just for the simplicity of the calculation. If we need 20 terawatts <laughs> of installed capacity to completely decarbonize the world, then even if we are all successful in our wildest dreams of building 100 reactors, we still only solve 10% of the problem. And this is so important. Because, and I'm going to show a slide that you don't typically see in, uh, in the nuclear sector, but I worked in renewables, and obviously there are some high TRLs for a lot of the technologies, but the reality is that the highest TRL does not always imply the best solution. And when you ask anyone about molten reactors, we're slated for 2040 and later. We need to fight individually to show how we can be deployed before the 2030s. And so the question is, how do we get in front of the line when you're at a nightclub? Well, it's either you know the balance and you've been there a couple of times or you're popular. And so I put a little definition of popularity, but obviously we all know what that is. But it's really centered on irrational feelings. Popularity are not, as you can see, it's being liked, admired, uh, or supported. These are irrational sensations. And so how do we make ourselves more popular? Well, if you look to the left, the average age in the US uh, nuclear sector is 43.1 years old. Now, if you look at the C-suite, you add an additional 10 years. At the bottom left, you can see basically, now this is old data, but, but you can see that there's a resurgence starting in 2014, 2015 of nuclear. Now that coincides with Elysium being formed, it coincides with me watching many of the videos in the sector. I wouldn't have been able to create this company if it weren't for uh, Kirk Sorensen with his videos, Leslie Dewan with her TED Talks, even Aslak Stuttgart that just spoke, and, uh, and obviously Jacob Dewan and Caroline Cochran. And so it's so important that we get the messaging out and that we encourage 
uh, the younger generations to really get involved and know that there's a, there's a place for them uh, in this sector. And as you can see on the right, there are some reports that have come out, but as you can see, as of 2016, there are 35,000 students that had, <laughs> that had obtained instruction from the Renewable Energy Academy. And this is something that we need to replicate. And as you can see at the bottom, the employment growth in the solar industry obviously has to do with a lot of the investment that, that went into there. But at the same time, it also has a lot to do with all the students like myself who said, we want to work in social impact industries. And obviously, solar seemed like the most obvious one. Not everyone had the exposure that we had. And so as I was waiting uh, these, two, <laughs> these two weeks thinking about the, the worst possible scenario, I like to joke around and say that in 40 years, I'll be part of those you know, telling the younger generations what we did in the 2020s to be able to change the course of history. Um, but here I was telling myself that may, that may not be a possibility. And so, you know, as you look at, if we want to successfully deploy these technologies, we really need to do a lot more community building effort. And we need to make sure that obviously we're cooperating on technical aspects and on advocacy aspects. Now, we need to do MSR only panels uh, and town halls. We need to engage with the public. We need to be able to do university tours, whether it's undergrad and grad and postgrad, and make sure that everyone is thinking about molten salt reactors. For me as an anti-nuclear, going from solid fuel to liquid fuel was one of the easiest differentiations to understand safety. Now, obviously, uh, there are many think tank roundtable discussions that we can do, but as a unit, together, we can convey a much stronger message as opposed to working in silos. And I have to salute the work of Jeff Naven that has done a terrific job with TerraPower, um, really talking to many of the different think tanks out there and really helping change their mind. And, and so I was actually you know, happy to be with him at the Environmental Defense Funds event in, in February to actually uh, keep that up. Now, on technical cooperation, obviously, that's a bit more difficult because we're each, all of us are spending so much money on our technology. Um, but at the end of the day, we really need to be forthcoming as much as we can on aspects that we don't want to necessarily control so we can leave room for the supply chain. It's not normal that companies with under 50 employees and over 200 employees are applying for the same pockets of money. This is something that needs to change if we want to create the supply chain because obviously the vendors are not going to be developing all the components. You know, Elysium, we're, we're pretty lazy in that sense, where we like to go to the vendors and say, okay, what do you have? And then we'll work with that, especially for our first, uh, our first units. But something that's really important is that we need standardized procedures, but we also need standardized equipment, such as reference electrodes. And again, there are many small businesses working on that, including one that we're teaming up with called Hyphonda. But obviously there's a lot of room for industry collaboration on topical reports. Uh, EPRI came to one of the MSR technical working group meetings and it was, it, was, it was very exciting because I definitely think that we should be working on fuel qualification in common. Uh, there are ways to keep the proprietary information separate, but it's very important that we, again, gather up as a community and as a unit uh, to be able to make sure that we do as little work as possible in proving our case to the regulator once we start the licensing process. Something that's extremely important that we need to do different from what was done with the Oak Ridge National Lab molten salt reactor experiment is involve all national labs in the MSR campaign. And I have to say, if everyone knew the funding that the MSR campaign had for the work that they're producing, they all deserve medals. Because every single time we've been getting zeroed out on many different areas. And again, we're coming back to the popularity piece. We need to make sure that molten salt reactors are front and center, not just in the nuclear industry, but in the global renewable sustainability movement. We need to make sure that in activists like Greta Thunberg know what a molten salt reactor and finally, something I really want to talk about as well is incentivizing incumbent participation and mergers and acquisitions. There's, no, there's nothing more powerful for the private investment community than to see a very active industrial base. If you look at the biotech, pharmaceutical industry, uh, they set a record year for mergers and acquisitions. We're talking about $357 billion. And so what signal does that send to the investment community? that they ought to put their dollars on these startups because you have clients afterwards that are here to buy them up. And so overall, there's a lot of new thinking that really needs to occur. And I hope that this presentation helped in showing ways in which we can get together and be able to get more solar reactors to be deployed in the next five years. And I say five years because if we were a national imperative, I have no doubt that we would have all the funding we need to validate every element that we talked about today or yesterday. And so with that said, thank you everyone. And uh, I'm open to any questions, comments, uh, or critiques, obviously. So, voila. I try to be mindful of time.
we actually do not have any questions for you. Um, a little bit surprised about that. Uh, I, uh, we have someone just agreeing with you. Uh, uh, well, at the end of the day, I, you know, one of the messages I definitely wanted to come across is if you're a university student or you just entered the national lab, don't hesitate to reach out because we really want to support you as much as possible. And if you're a student who wants to create a competitor, all the better. We really need to create a much more populated industry. Um, again, another one I think Carl is 100% correct. Um, no, we're very pleased to see, you know, uh, speaking in, uh, from the technical community, we want, you know, that use. I remember that report from 2010 where they're pointing out that the leadership is, you know, the US design is for the leadership to come from the industry. And we're looking forward to seeing, seeing that and we're very pleased to see this. Okay, I got something from Abdullah uh, from INL. Why focus on PU burning? Programs such as the VTR have struggled to convince DOE to use their PU stockpiles as a fuel load. So that's a, that's a great question. Uh, when we presented uh, last year, uh, we spoke about uh, the fact that we want to be able to disarm the world. And uh, at the end of the day, I think that if we really want to tackle uh, many of the issues around nuclear, uh, I think it's a very strong signal to the market if we're able to get rid of the equivalent of about 200 nuclear weapons um, with our demo units. And uh, if you're not making money with what's coming out of the reactor, you ought to make money with what you're getting rid of inside. 